What is up, everybody? Welcome to the stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And on the stack, we talk about a ton of books that come out this week. Let's kick it off with Star Girl, The Lost Children, number one from DC Comics, written uh-huh. by Jeff Johns, art by Todd Nock. Now, last week, we talked about The New Golden Age by Jeff Johns that was kicking off a bunch of books, including this one. This is bringing back the original team on Stargirl for a new story set in the world that brings some of the flavor of the TV show, I would argue, while looping in the idea of a bunch of sidekicks that have gone missing. I know we were big fans of Stargirl back in the day. We obviously liked the show, though we ended up not quite following it through the third season with our podcast. But what did you think about this book? Did it hold up to the legacy of Stargirl, the comics? and the TV series. Pete, take it away. Uh, I really love the tone. I feel like it has a really fun tone to it. The The art and the writing match in such a cool kind of way. I really enjoyed this iteration of Stargirl. I really liked what it was saying, the panels. I, I thought it was such a fun comic uh, and brought up the funness of the TV show kind of uh, hold. So I, I felt like they did a great job with this. I thought it was a really solid first ish. Um, they did like to blend the TV uh, versions of the characters uh, into a sort of deeply uh, continuity steep story that the Jeff Johns is telling here. That's not easy. And I thought they did a good job of sort of like, uh, just w- like sliding it all together without being like this is the TV continuity or this character is different here. Like it, it felt like one piece, which I think was really cool. I think Jeff Johns um, does a great job in general of looking at some legacy things in, in the DC universe and finding some hits and building a story out of that. Sometimes it goes a little too far, like we talked about with all the Watchmen elements in um, the New Golden Age. Uh, but in general, like I was excited about this. I am a big Starman fan, as some of you may know. And so the cosmic rod to sort of having a, like a light up personality is not my favorite, but that is where we are. I think with this, uh, rod, where we <laughs> cosmic are, <though>. rod. <laughs> uh, let's make sure to rod. check in where we are with the rods in each issue as we get to them. Yeah. But I, I where think are you guys with the rod. Uh, I'll tell you where I am with the rod. I also liked this book. I was kind of uh, bowled over is the wrong word, but a little overwhelmed with the maybe the first half of the issue, which is like, okay, here's what's going on. You read the entire series of Stargirl, right? As well as all of these one shots, and you have a deep dive into the DC universe. You understand all this stuff, but Jeff Johns does it in a way where it's these nonstop info dumps but it comes through the emotions of the characters. So even if there's a lot of information that's going on at the beginning, by the end of the book, you get to this really smart, very crisp concept when it comes to sidekicks and how they relate to superheroes, puts them in this new situation, introduces these characters that, honestly, unless you're 70 or 80 years old, you probably have no frame of reference for whatsoever, but I am very involved and invested in the story by the end. And that's really all you need. If you lay in the information to get through it and it works, who cares? So uh, I'm very happy with this first issue. I'm happy Stargirl is back. And I think for people who are bummed that the series is wrapping up very soon now, just a couple of episodes to go, this is a great thing to pick up and get right into. And it'll be a nice segue from one thing to another. Let's move on to talk about another reboot here. I Hate Fairyland, number one, from Image Comics, written by Scotty Young, art by Brett Bean. If you didn't check out the great first series from Image Comics, this was about a girl named Gert who is sucked into the magical fairyland that is a happy, cheery place where wishes come true, and she can never leave, and suddenly goes insane and starts murdering everybody, and went on many adventures that had some deep emotional bent and also a lot of bleeped-out cursing to them. Them. Finally, she escaped mm. at the end of the last series. Here we catch up with Gert. It's been years later. She is now an adult. Her life sucks in the real world, and everybody <laughs> hates her. And uh, I won't spoil how Welcome she gets in the real world, back. Gert. 
There you go. I won't spoil how she gets sucked back into fur fairyland. I was a little nervous about going back here and whether if you were repetitive, but I think Young has found a delightful new premise here to get us back to this yeah. world. I think it's really smart. And it's really good. It doesn't meet a beat for, miss a beat from the first series. What do you guys think about this one? I, I agree. I think it, it really does do a great job of uh, uh, capturing all the madness and uh, moving the story forward in a, in a fun way. I feel like uh, with this premise, I'm excited to go back um, and see kind of how this all uh, goes down. Yeah, I feel like uh, Gert is such a fun, interesting character that you can relate to. So, I, I yeah, I just feel like... I mean, realistically, the arts, the reason you show up, Scotty Young is an unbelievable artist, but the, this, this is, fairyland is such a This is a different artist. This is Brett, this is Brett Bean. Bean. Oh, wow. But uh, I, I well, hear you what you're saying, Pete, because it is in the sort of world of Scotty Young's art from right. back in the day, which I think is why um, they make a great team here. There are a lot of, if you love eyeballs bursting out of a smashed up face, this is the book for you. Because um, Brett Bean really does a good job of showing extreme uh, facial expressions, very much in the vein of Ren and Stimpy, if you're mm -hmm. a fan, uh, from back in the Powder day. Powder Toast Man. Powder Toast Man. Um, there's a lot of big emotions, and you even the sort of sad parts of Gert's life here are um, still very extreme in everything that's happening. Fun read. Yeah, Blade. fun over the top. Blade. Vampire Nation number one from Marvel, written by Mark Russell, art by Dave Wachter. This is, uh, I'm going to say, unfortunately, a one shot. And I say unfortunately because I love the idea of what's going on here. Dracula has established yeah. a vampire nation near uh, in Russia. Uh, near Chernobyl, and uh, Blade has been named the sheriff of this new vampire nation. He investigates a mystery here. There is a assassination that happens on one of Dracula's lieutenants. I love this setup, and I was so bummed to see follow the rest of Blade's adventures over an adventure, Avengers at the end here, because I was completely jazzed for this concept in the series. And it turns out to just be one issue. Yeah, it's yeah, one I mean, and done. It's a, it's a, go ahead, Justin. I was going to say, Mark Russell in here, um, writing not in his usual, there's less comedy happening here than um, in mm -hmm. a lot of his other work. Just a really great sort of um, double, or I guess probably I guess single MacGuffin mystery happening um, <laughs> that uh, catches you off guard. But the premise, like, um, a, a vampire nation set up on the in the ashes of uh, Chernobyl and Dracula as a like bureaucracy leading politician uh, and all the humans versus vampires and who lives where and why. It's just great world building that uh, I agree. I want to see more of. Yeah, I, I, I was just uh, it was like a one shot that when you got to the end of it, you're like, oh, OK. But you were kind of like, this is so cool. I want more while you're reading it. Yeah, the kind of who done it mystery that unravels here is really well done. Very interesting. Great use of Blade. I feel like this was such a cool uh, one shot that, uh, yeah, selfishly, I want more. And I think they did a great job of like, you know, just giving you one and being like, well, you know, maybe if you fans get loud enough, we will get more. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah I mean, that's us. selfish. It's it's not selfish to want more, Pete. You want a two shot, a three shot, not yeah. a one shot. That's true. I, I want I want more shots in this world because it is. I, fun. I mean, listen. I get the idea that a Blade title is not going to be the top selling title of the month necessarily, but this is such a smart, interesting concept. It's the sort of thing that's like this is a TV show right here. Half vampire is the sh who hates vampires is forced to be the sheriff of Vampire Nation, working for Dracula. That's great. There's a million stories yeah. that you could spin out there in a bunch of different ways you can go. I hope people pick this up and I hope they make more because I'm super into it. Let's move to one that they are making more of Batman One Bad Day, Mr. Freeze, number one from DC Comics, written by Jerry Dugan, <laughs> art by Matteo Scalera. The Dugues. The Dugues. This is a one shot in a series of one shots that focus on 
one bad day for the different villains in Batman's rogues gallery. Here we're focusing on Mr. Freeze and a back in the day, not exactly beginning of his career, Batman, but beginning of Robin's career, Batman, and how they work together. Yeah. There's a little bit of a mixing in of that plot line here. What did you guys think about this one? Well, I mean, first off, you got to talk about the art. I mean, this is just super tight bananas. I mean, the shit is ripe. It's mm. really just uh, uh, so well done. I got to ask, and, do you uh, work out this know. stuff in advance? Like, do you spend all week? A hundred percent. Yeah. No, no, I don't. No? Okay. I was so no, you moved. Mean, truly, there's I'm, every. It's like an issue. It's like a comic book series where, like, each new episode we do, there's a little. It pushes a little further down. The a little bit. Line, a little well, further. the art it, it moves you. You know what I mean? It moves but you. The, in art, the art is making you say, "Tight bananas getting ripe," because uh, I don't the, think shit, shit is ripe. Um, but I, I just what? also, I think they, um. I just think it's 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 really such an interesting kind of look. And we all know Victor Freeze is not the greatest, you know, but the fact that we kind of have these people pulling for a love story or uh, people want, jumping on information for different reasons and then kind of like Victor Freeze kind of, you know, spoilers being like, no, nah, I'm just a piece of shit. Um, but uh, I, I think this is a, a really fun story. These one shots have been really great. Uh, I really appreciate them and I've been loving uh, all of them. I feel like they're such interesting, cool stories and the looks into the kind of Batman and Robin dynamic are great. Just love the Robin stuff and also the kind of Christmas morning moment that we get there that we get to see. Also really fun covers as well. Ice to see you, I say to this book um, because I'm happy to read it. Um, we talked a little bit on the live show about um, Kevin Conroy's death. And um, if you're looking for something to sort of uh, a new comic that would take you to that Batman the Animated Series level, I think this book does a great job of feeling like um, a standout episode of that show, which yeah. did a lot of great Mr. Freeze um, episodes. Yeah, it really uh, did. In the series. And I think the character's story of a love story, like a, a, a broken love story. And then the way that this story undercuts it, I thought was really cool. There's some fun jokes in here. If you've been jonesing for an Alfred that's alive, I personally like a, a corpse Alfred, but if you like a living <laughs> Alfred, he is here butling his, his butt off um, and just the way you want. And really, this is sort of a sneaky Robin led story yeah. uh, in a fun way that also it undercuts the Mr. Freeze villainy while also giving him some sort of uh, stronger, positive character elements at the same time. So it was just a cool, unexpected uh, story. Really great. Yeah, I it took me a little while, honestly, to get into the tone of this because the past. Oh, of come months, on, man. No, because the past couple of One Bad Day ones have been pretty intense, very grim, very dark. This was not that. There's the still art. Some, there's still some dark stuff that goes on here, but I think Justin is very apt with the Batman, the animated series comparison. It also reminded me a little bit of the Jeff Loeb, Tim Sale Batman stuff as well. And yes. Mateo Ooh. Scalera's art, I think, is very different, but it still was channeling some of the sense there. And I think Jerry Dugan was channeling some of the, the writing rhythms that Jeff Loeb put in his Batman stuff as well. So by the end, I was very much into it. And I like the uh, twist is the wrong word, but emotional take on Mr. Freeze and Nora Freeze and the relationship there, I thought was very smart. So there you go. Let's move on and talk yeah. about my favorite issue of the week, Chroma number one from Image Comics Ooh. by Lorenzo De Felici. This was teased a bit, I believe, in the Image Comics 30th anniversary series yes. that is going on right now. Mm -hmm. But this mm -hmm. takes place in a world where, well, a city where color has gone out. They are only black and white and gray, and that is it because the king of color has sent monsters to attack them. They're the last remaining human city, or so they are told. And in this issue, we meet one of the young acolytes who follows this religion as he bonds with a girl who has been painted as a monster, monster. controlled by the king of colors. Not only is this a great story, this is a brilliant use of the comic book form and color and art 
to tell a story that gives you suspense through color, uh, which is something that I don't think yeah. I have ever seen in the entire time I've been reading comics. Well, take it easy with that. I mean, I think this what is you're the saying best is very... comic I've ever read in my entire life. That's what I'm saying. Take it away, Pete. Okay, and he just no, said, I mean... mucho take it easy over here with all that big talk. Hey, uh, I'm just saying that, fun. like, yes, the the use of color in here is brilliant, but we have seen a lot of, of comics that use color as punctuation, use color in different ways to tell a story, and I think that this does that uniquely, uh, you know, so very much creatively impressive as shit. I mean, I was just such a cool kind of like, I don't want to give away, but the monster girl, uh, uh, the discovery there is, is so, so cool and so fun. So um, Pete, just real quick, you love it, but you don't want Alex to love it as much. As <laughs> no, no. I, I, I just, I think that we've seen color used in a lot of different amazing ways. And I don't think well, this is Well, let like... me throw out. I think the difference there is okay. this takes the use of color that you see in like a, a Batman black and white or any of those right. books that are using right. color in that way. And it pushes it into the actual narrative where the color choice feels like uh, it's part of the world. And the fact that it's being told in a comic book medium means that we get to really see that play out in this um, really true to form way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I, I, I feel a lot better now. Great. And that's what this is. This podcast is all about is making each other feel good. <laughs> we're like just massaging each other over the course of an hour but, um, as we review these comics. But man, as far as our first issue goes, like just cannot wait for more from this world. Really set an amazing tone and, uh, and, and yeah, just one of the best. I, I don't want to oh, spoil it by any means, but beyond just being a great first issue that really explores and set up this world and the conflicts of the characters and you as the reader know uh, what's kind of going on here or at least suspect what's going on here even if the characters don't but that's part of the plot but fantastic last page like incredible not just last not just incredible last page but incredible use of the page turn to the last page i was just very yes agree justin what do you think about this one i loved it in the same way that uh you're describing like it's a great story. It's a great like exploration. Um, our main character learns some harsh lessons right out of the gate. I mean, it, there's an easy comparison to the book, um, The Giver, if you um, mm -hmm. have ever read that from back in the day, which is about, uh, there's some similar themes here um, and similar ideas, um, but I love this as well. Uh, yeah, the last page kind of is amazing, but also is very shocking and i was like kind of upset by it yeah i think that's where you're supposed to be. i mean of Look. course that's what the end of that's a cliffhanger pete mm -hmm. you're hanging on a cliff there yeah you go. i'm i'm worried about it i'm worried about what's happening star you're, wars you're, yeah you're on the edge of a cliff star wars hidden empire number one from marvel written by charles Saul, art by stephen cummings this is picking up on a bunch of plot lines from star wars books that to be honest, we have not been following very closely. But Kira, the character that everybody knows and loves from Solo, a Star Wars story, is now the head of the Crimson Dawn, a crime syndicate that is seeded throughout the Star Wars universe. Here she is coming face to face, kind of, with Emperor Palpatine and trying Oof. to take him down. There's a lot of moves and counter moves going on here. This is obviously the culmination of a lot of stuff that, again, we did not follow in the Star Wars comics, but is kicking off a story in its own right. What'd you think about this? I felt like this was a great first issue. Uh, really love the art. Uh, I mean, talking shit to the Emperor, I don't think is the greatest strategy move and like kind of like spelling out your plan, but it'll be interested to see how this breaks down. But man, I, I thought this was uh, such a, a solid first issue. Great story really kind of gets you excited for more. I've been surprised by the sheer density of um, the Star Wars books that we've been talking about uh, lately. It's just sort of a wall of information. And I, I haven't read the series that lead is leading into this. So it feels like all of this information is new to me. 
Um, I, I like the characters. I just don't quite understand all of the situations and the fact that it this is sort of pinned into a very specific time in the Star Wars universe where we know what happens to these villains specifically uh, before and right after when this is happening. I'm curious how they're going to um, sort of ride that line because they are fully in direct conflict with Darth Vader and the Emperor. You don't you don't, you don't trust the soul, bro? I trust the soul. I lo love my soul. I wouldn't sell my soul to the devil for but sure. charles soul is an amazing writer he's he's done such an amazing job you would think you would trust the soul a little bit to be like hey you know this guy knows what he's doing i'm gonna ha i'm not gonna question trust, ha hashtag trust the soul hashtag don't question the soul as pete's saying um <laughs> but i all i'm saying is like I, it it's a harder writing challenge than um you don't think he's other... up for the task, bro? You think he's running himself into a corner? You think this is his first project? <laughs> no, what, I, I, to wrestle I, I, him? What, are you, what are you hyping this hold up? Hold on, just to interrupt here for a second, I think if anything, he's writing himself out of a corner because the the book, like Justin was saying, a lot of it is like, hey, you have been reading these 56 other Star Wars series. Real quick, I'm just going to recap what's going on there, but through a narrative device. But the place it ends up with with frankly and this is a bit of a spoiler here but with kira going to a place where it's like oh, this isn't gonna work out well for you we don't see you anywhere <laughs> else in star wars and this is probably how that happens this is probably how you're taken off the board by palpatine because we know he's gonna be okay going forward um this is it sets it up as a little bit of a tragedy and i think that gives it really interesting emotional stakes so mm. like you were saying there's a lot of stuff going on here there's a lot of like the mystical side of Star Wars, which frankly I'm not quite as into necessarily as the more technical side, but the place that it gets to you by the end there, I do think is very interesting and I'm curious to check out the second issue. Let's talk about one that trust I think we soul, can bro. all agree on and trust the soul on Nightwing number 98 from DC Comics, written by Tom Taylor, art by Daniela DiNicolo. There was a big cliffhanger in the last issue where Rick the version of Nightwing who was shot in the head and lost his memory and was driving a cab showed up where Nightwing and Barbara were having a sex vacation with a mobster. And it gets revealed in this issue that that Rick isn't Rick at all. It's actually Nightmite, a fifth Nightmite, Nightmite. Imp, Nightmite, a fifth dimensional imp who is obsessed with Nightwing in the same way that Batmite is obsessed with Batman and Mr. Ms. Plissick? is obsessed with Superman. Um, Mesoplick. 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 Anyway, great issue. What? I loved it. Justin, I know you love this one, so why don't you talk about it a little bit? I love this. I mean, the fact that they were able to um, work uh, the Rick Grayson stories in here even a little bit was amazing. Uh, something that feels like such a departure from so much of other Nightwing stories that we probably won't touch on it much in the future. Um, but, and the fact that this book is able to mix so many different tones, like, um, this is like a wild comedy tone in here where anything's happening. There's a lot of teleportation, um, jokes, and it all still works. Um, I think it's fantastic and I'm looking forward to planning my next sex vacation in a similar manner. <laughs> well, if you're going to need a hostage, so you know, keep that in mind. You got to always have, this is something they don't talk about. It, like your, uh, your travel agent won't say, have a hostage on your sex vacation. <laughs> Guys, it's a life hack. It makes everything more fun because it, really yeah, it, it gives you something to do. Yeah, It gives you something to do outside of the bedroom where you're oh like, let's God. go talk to the hostage. Let's go out. Tie so the feed the hostage. You got to, yeah, yeah. It's the whole thing. Um, yeah, I mean, what what stuff is, Nightwing has been so amazing, and it's at such a peak of, like, oh, my God, what's going to happen next? To have, like, a timeout for the, you know, Nightmite issue was a little bit for me, like, oh, all right, well, we'll ha call a timeout and have some fun with Nightmite. But I really want to get back into all the things that are happening. Um, so it was a little bit of a swerve for me where I was like, ah, um, but it was it's creative and hilarious and i also agree with night might on the ships you know what i mean like uh you know for me it was uh i feel what? like star girl uh was such Starfire? a better, yeah starfire was such a better match no yeah I, I, but at the same time this is sort of a, a 
bit of a, a, a goof around issue. The we get some interesting revelations about the idea of mar them getting married, which I thought mm -hmm. were sort of interesting. Oh yeah, that was like yeah, and then the fact that uh, you know spoilers, but uh, Batman was really there was such a fun like holy shit, are you really here? It was such a uh, fun thing. Yeah, as well. I mean, to Batman be clear, this carbs. is not. This is not like a bottle episode or anything. This still has emotional ramifications for everything that's going on in Nightwing. It is like I would argue every issue of Tom Taylor's run on Nightwing. It is a mission statement on who Nightwing is and what he means to people, because the idea is how he inspires Nightmite, how he inspires this young girl who is being attacked by demons. It also deals with the fallout of Blockbuster being killed by yeah. a heartbreaker is that the name of the villain who's attacking right now so there's still stuff in there it's not like a complete swerve it is still laying in that emotional groundwork for all these things and again like pete said big spoilers here but i think the biggest thing is night might says hey dick you should be the next blockbuster you should be the guy who runs stuff in bloodhaven and i think that's where yeah. we're going to go. Like, I think that's the direction things are going to head in. Well, when we get what I like going forward is uh, it feels like we're going to get the Dick Grayson version of Matches Malone. Mm. Um, coming Ooh, that's my yeah. prediction based Ooh, on. Uh, we didn't talk just... about Matches Malone back when we were talking one bad day. Matches Malone, and I know I mentioned this, and I know you guys don't agree with me here, is the most ridiculous thing in Batman. Go fuck okay, yourself. Get, get out of here. I'm sorry. Go love fuck yourself. Sorry, Malone. Then. The idea Matches that, Malone like, is fantastic, dude. The first way. Bruce Things Wayne that he does as matches is hysterical. Bruce Wayne, one of the most famous guys in Gotham City, if not the entire mm -hmm. world, puts a toothpick in his mouth and a little mustache it's on glasses. Uh, it's, it's a, a glasses. Match, it's Alex. Um, he puts uh, a match in it. It's okay. a match. What's a match? Oh, what's a match in? And he's like, hey, oh, I'm matches below. Hey, what's going on? Give me and some he, information. He does some makeup, like, too. He does some makeup. Let me ask you a question. When does matches below do all this crime that everybody loves? In the late afternoon. Pre <laughs> oh, okay. Follows. okay, Batman just does yeah. a bunch of crime. Like, he does a bunch of crime to lay in some people trust matches below. He doesn't actually do the crime. He just says he's doing the crime, he, man. He's just he, got the money he to He can't prove do it. the crime. Some money he, around. Don't do the time. That's what I'm going to say. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, my God. If you don't have do the, the time. time yeah, whatever. don't do the crime. Whatever it is, just don't do it. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, I will say this is the equivalent of like um, Leonardo DiCaprio putting a match in his mouth and going and being like, hey, I'm a criminal over here. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, you guys want to go Nobody's commit some full. crimes? Yeah. And the fact that yeah. nobody has ever it's, like, hey, you look like Bruce Wayne. And he'd be like, hey, no, it's I'm comic Bruce books, Wayne. man. It's talking about it's the whole glasses Clark Kent thing. All right. You nope. got to give it a doesn't work for me. <laughs> It matches Malone oh, yeah. is my breaking point when it comes to comics. Voyages wow, that's number not one. Possible. <laughs> Voyages number one from Image Comics by Sume Keskin. This is a wild, very, I don't know, I would say French sci fi style comic with a yes. bunch of crazy French. stuff going on. The, uh, well, just in terms of like, uh, French sci-fi comics always feel very woolly to there me. There aren't people smoking with, like, berets in here. Why do you say French? That's racist to French people, okay? First of all, to be very clear. Uh, second of all... I'm, I'm French. You know, you can, can, you can actually... Like that. You, you can smoke. You're just Pete LaPage. Yeah. Pete the Page, to translate. Um, You can smoke a beret. You just roll it right up. <laughs> Tobacco on the inside. Anyway, a bunch of sci-fi stuff. Justin's like, I read on papers. Book. I used to beret. <laughs> What'd you think about this one? What? Oh, this is great. This is really just a very creative, fun landscape that is a very uh, interesting, unique world that we kind of get sucked into here. It's a, what do I like? It's you, you jump right in. You can, can pick up what's going on. It's a very unique style, which I appreciate. I like the character designs in this. I was really, uh, I felt like this was a great first issue. You kind of get to know the main character and what's going on a little bit. And there's a little bit more than meets the eye when it comes to her. So yeah, just fun, uh, kind of classic setup. And uh, I feel like it was well executed and, and moved really well. And I really, uh, you know, to repeat myself, appreciate the character designs, the world, world building. 
If you asked your friend Tripping Balls to explain <laughs> Star Wars to you, that's what this comic is. Oh, interesting. Fair enough. I, I don't want to make it seem like it's a ripoff of anything. It's not. No, a... I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. It's like the it has the elements of uh, the Star Wars story. There's um, you know, there's like all these crises. Like, oh, we gotta get over here, but it's like, yeah, the, the ship's powered by plants, man. That's what you gotta <laughs> think about. It's powered by plants, so they gotta water the plants, and then they gotta get to the other side of the universe. Yeah, man, Wonder Beach, man. Gold Goblin, Wonder Beach, man. Gold Goblin, number one from Marvel, written by Christopher Cantwell, art by Lan Medina. This is a busy week for Christopher Cantwell. I believe we have three titles in the stack yeah. here from wow. his. Wow! But this is a spinoff of Amazing Cantwell Spider-Man, stack. where Norman Osborn has had his sins purged and is a good guy now. Uh, we didn't cover these books in Amazing Spider-Man the last couple of issues. There's been a whole Hobgoblin war going on, and Norman Osborn stepped up to become what is now being called the Gold Goblin. He's trying to be a hero, but at the same time, as revealed in this issue, he's still having the, some of the old Norman Osborn stuff going on in the background. Between the art and the writing, this reminded me very fondly of the... I think it was Thunderbolts, not Dark Avengers title back in the day where Norman Osborn mm, was trying yeah. to run the Thunderbolts out of Thunderbolt Mountain and slowly just discombobulating as he went. And I I went into this not wanting to read a book about Norman Osborn, not being interested in Goblin stuff or anything like this. But the way they delve into his psychology, I thought was really smart and really interesting and very dark. What about you guys? What did you think? Well, I... Did you want to go? Go ahead, go ahead. I feel like this was... You know, like it was it was going hard to be like, I'm different from the other goblins. I don't have pumpkin bombs. I have nanobots, you know, and I was like, all right, guy, you're a fucking goblin. You're even talking to yourself like a goblin. You got a lot of psychological stuff going on like a regular goblin. So like it's called gold <laughs> goblin. You're a fucking goblin. Um I did really appreciate the art style, though. It was very cool. I will, uh, you know, there's a, a line in there that they kind of pulled from Tombstone instead of like, you're no Daisy, you're no Daisy at all. It's you're no Goblin, you're no Goblin at all. So that kind of mm. pulled me out a little bit. But um, <laughs> I felt uh, like... Pete, uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, not to pip you out or anything. People listening might not know this, but Pete has like a whole Jeff Foxworthy style routine about you are being Goblin yeah. if... Do you want to do it real quick, yeah. Pete? We'll give you like a tight oh, five dude, right Just now. do like two. Yeah, do five. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know you're a goblin when you're flying around on a glider, you know? Yeah, that's good. And there wasn't, yeah. wasn't, didn't, 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 <laughs> you got one? I'll tell you what, it doesn't one? kill. It does not kill. It just no, doesn't do does well not in kill. clubs or If or you've got a hidden closet yeah. that's full of pumpkin <laughs> bombs, yeah, you might be a goblin. There you Woo. go. Nice job. But my uh, what the fuck moment in this comic was when the couple kids walked up to him and were like, hey, can you s- sign my human skull? He's like, <laughs> yeah. Celebrities get that. Celebrities get that a lot. They're just like us celebrities. Yeah. That's the yeah, new hot thing. Kids like... don't use social media anymore. Now they just uh, carry human skulls around to have people sign them. 100%. The original social media. Um, Real quick, I if thought... someone asks you to sign their human skull, you just you just whip out a pen, no no questions asked. The level of fame I'm at, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I like this exploration of I, the, this new Norman Osborn is sort of a weird uh, spot. Like I don't know, he seems very hard to trust naturally. Um, but it, it does seem like his sins have been eaten. I like the ghosts haunting him that we're seeing here. And it does feel like you can see the downfall brewing of him getting recognized for the goblin stuff that he's doing, even if it's for good, feels like a dangerous path for him to walk. So it's an interesting status quo that we're in right now. GCPD, The Blue Wall, number two from DC Comics, written by John Ridley, art by Stefano Raphael. This is a very serious down-to-earth look at the Gotham City Police Department, specifically focusing on three 
former rookies who have now joined the force in different capacities as we found out last issue one of them had neglected to fire her gun on a perp and the second time when she does finally fire a gun, two people die in the process. That's where we pick up here. It is tied to a bunch of other aspects of the police department, as well as Renee Montoya, who is still grappling with a bunch of bad stuff that happened to her back in the day involving Two-Face. I yeah. love this book. I love how complicated it is. Yeah. I love how much it's delving into police dynamics. It reminds me very fondly of Gotham Central, the Greg Rucka book from back in the day. And it, it seems like a very clear extension and follow up on that. But how are you guys feeling? What do you think? Well, I agree with you. It feels like the pulling Gotham Central into sort of the modern understanding we have of police departments in our world, um, which I think is a, a cool place to be. The Renee Montoya stuff, one of my favorite characters in the Batman universe. Oh, yeah. It's always strange to figure out exactly what her continuity is because she's done a lot of, she's been the question, and in some stories she just is the question still. Um, the A lot of her relationship with Two-Face was something that really played into, was that New 52 or mm -hmm. one of the, the DC Weekly series? She was a featured player and it was about um, her relationship to him. And it seems like that is definitely real here, but maybe not any of this sort of more supernatural stuff associated with her. Um, but I, I would read Renee Montoya's stories um, all the do da day. Yeah, I don't know why you're hating on the fact that Montoya is a great character and used in a lot of different uh, areas. I'm I, mean, not I believe she it. was she was used I'm in gargoyles it. too. You know what I mean? Like you know, she's a great character and uh, gargoyles. That's a different. Um, that's um, a different character. It's uh, what's her name? It's like Alyssa Manzaro or something like that. Uh, are you sure? I thought it was the same. Uh, my bad. My oh, bad. That I gotta, seems kind of racist. Rewatch. But go ahead, Pete. Oh. <laughs> All right, well, touche. But uh, I will I, say that, that that character does. Elisa uh, Maza is her name, and she does share um, a lot of her name on Toya qualities. She's a cop. Um. <laughs> anyways, I I this is just real world stressful. You know, like this is it's dealing with a lot of uh, problems with you know uh, cops and real life stress of you know having a gun and making the right choice in a very heightened moment so it's it's hard to read i'm glad that they're doing it i think it's important to push these things and ask tough questions and you know comics is a safe place to kind of explore that but man it is like reading this i'm like oh god oh man uh so yeah it's it's tough to read in that in that aspect so Shirtless Bear Fighter 2, number four from Image Comics, written by Jody Love, <laughs> art by Neil Vendrell. Comics, a, they can be anything to anybody. In this two real sister books right next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in this issue, the shirtless bear fighter has been thrown into prison. There's a clone of him, a muck, who is making his... Uh, attacking a bunch of bears, which you would think he would be doing, but uh, this clone is attacking too many bears. Anyway, if you like nonstop <laughs> bear puns, this is the book for you. Pete, take it away. Uh, this is just so over the top fun, ridiculous. I, I I enjoy it. I think like, okay, this is crazy. How is this still going? Am I still going to have fun with this book? And the answer is yes. I do have a ton of fun with this book. It's leans into its ridiculous over the topness and and all the right ways and uh yeah I, I i am always pleasantly surprised by this book and where it goes so it's just a ton of fun and uh over the top and fun we've did taken it shirtless, was over the top you did we've taken shirtless bear fighting to its logical extreme with this book it's um a, a shirtless man who shaved multiple times uh and he still is fighting bears well, another version of that man is fighting more bears without pants. That's the twist. Oh, do you see what they did there? It's great. Uh, there's too few humor books that don't take themselves too seriously. This is one that definitely does it. Mm -hmm. Like Pete is saying, I can't believe they keep finding new variations on bear puns every single issue. I have a blast reading this every time. It's a delight. Captain America and the Winter Soldier special number one from Marvel written by Jackson Lansing and Colin Kelly art by Kev Walker. If you are reading the Captain America series, this is a essential one shot 
don't essential look essential at... read. It, it legitimately is. Like I was expecting, oh, this will be a you know back in the day story about the Winter Soldier, and it won't be important to the main narrative. No, this is a direct follow up to the last issue of Captain America. It is a bridge to the next issue of Captain America. It shows what happens when Bucky takes on the identity of the Revolution, and not only that, reveals the whole history of the outer yeah. circle is that the name of the organization whatever it is the secret yes. organization that has been controlling history here and i'll throw something out at you guys to discuss or not up to you obviously mm. what really Ooh. drove down on me with this issue we've been talking about how this run on captain america is very ed brubaker this issue at the very least but i think a lot of the concepts this is Jonathan Hickman. This is the like straight up mm. down to the circles yes. doing a Jonathan Hickman story. <laughs> and uh, it's great. They're making it work. This team's making it work. This is awesome. That's such a great comparison. I hadn't thought of that, but it's so spot on, especially the sort of baton pass from the Captain America book, which I think was more Ed Brubaker. This feels like now we're going to get deep here. We're going to get into a bunch of characters that we've never seen before and establish them and act like they've been around forever. A classic Jonathan Hickman move. Um, but I'm really liking this. The way that um, Lansing and Kelly are sort of carving out this little um, uh, circle of their own Captain America universe here is awesome. It's what I've been wanting to see from a Captain America series. So it's it's great. Yeah, I feel like the... Uh the kind of reveal of this like creepy ass game that's been being played for so long is a, is an interesting move. Um, and I and like that game is that game is Jenga just to be clear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the worst game of Jenga ever. Uh, but no, I just think that it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting to put that kind of on what's, what's kind of happening. So like that felt a little weird, but I like, everything else around it. Like I like all the characters. I like what it means. And I like the choice that Bucky makes at the end, I think is a really cool, fun choice. And so I'm interested to see what's going forward, but I felt like it was a little bit like, okay, all right, first off, there's all these old ass people who've been playing this creepy ass fucking game and using people as pawns for a long time. Okay. You just, you've never heard about it until now. And now we're going to, you know, so, uh, but other than that, but I was really impressed. That's with... classic comics, and that's why I bring up the Hickman thing in particular. It feels like his S.H.I.E.L.D. book, which is like, oh, S.H.I.E.L.D.'s not an organization that's existed since Nick Fury has been around. It's been around forever. Or Secret yeah. Warriors. Well, this is my matchstick malone comics breaking moment i guess i when you when they're like oh this thing has been going on the whole time it's like sure i've been reading comics the whole time i should have picked up on something motherfuckers i 100 you know, like... agree with you and i think the same way that that is actually a great comparison the same way that you're like yeah he puts a matchstick in his mouth and he's a different person now and everybody accepts it this is something like is on the side of me being like Sure, we've seen this a bunch of times, and I know it doesn't make sense if you go back and read all the comic books, but that's okay. But for you, it's not, so I get it. There you go. I, I like that we've established both of your breaking points. Um, yeah, and I if can't you're wait curious, for yours. Mine is one more level deep on Pete's banana pun. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Buckle very up, close, but, I'm yeah, very close week, to my breaking next point. Next week, yeah. <laughs> next week, I bet it's going to be next comic. Um, <laughs> let me ask you real quick. <laughs> what board game could you play forever? Mm. Ooh. What? Oh, I'm horrible at board games. They usually end up in fist fights, so. You're mad at them because you get mad? I legitimately. No, I usually get I... in a fight with somebody. I, I could play Monopoly forever. I know nobody else can. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Every can... game of Monopoly <laughs> is forever. It so is I think forever. You, you so I'm right playing it forever. I have no problem. I will always outlast other people on Monopoly because I'm like, yeah, let's go. Wow, that's a, that's a always fucking outlast. challenge. Yeah, dude, I'm, let's go. Let's, let's go. fucking let's go. go. Monopoly let's live go. stream coming up. Here we go. Oh, I mean, you know, we started the, we started the TikTok. 
It's time for the Twitch. It's time for us to get on there and play a uh, insult roast be, laden version of Monopoly. This could be our critical role, except with Monopoly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm the like Monopoly, Monopoly, Monopoly and play thimble. with us. Yeah, there we go. No, DC's, I'm the thimble. Oh, I'm we'll the top be three hat. thimbles. Well, I'm again. the top hat. <laughs> of course you're the top hat. Of course you're the top hat. Deceased, I'm battle. actually the shoe. I prefer the shoe. Deceased, War of the Undead uh-huh. Gods, number four from DC Comics, written by Tom Taylor, art by Trevor Harrison and Neil Edwards. In this issue, things are amping up as the anti-life equation slash zombie plague spreads throughout the universe and the heroes of New Earth head to Oa to mount a final offense. And it goes, of course, terribly wrong. What do you think about this issue, you dudes? Speaking of Mixoplex, uh, yeah, I mean, this is the Alfred stuff was very sweet. If it's real, I'm not sure. Like at the end, we're not sure what's real and what's not. And what do you mean if it's real or not? What are you talking about? Well, Mixoplex showed up and was like, oh, this is all, you know, like fucked up. You don't know what's real. So I I wasn't sure if like everything that happened that. Uh, Wait, are you saying you think Alfred's not real? Well, I just, I felt like at the end, he was just kind of like, yeah, I've been fucking with you. So I wasn't sure if everything that we read right. was like real Pete, or if let it me was be honest real. with you. Alfred is definitely giving the old finger sandwiches to Leslie Tompkins. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and that is how Alfred refers to sex, just in case you're wondering. That's <laughs> oh not Alex God. being weird. That's no, an it's... incontinuity no, way. That's a bu- the way butlers talk about sex. It's an upstairs, downstairs thing. <laughs> Exactly, which is another way that they're referring to sex. Yep. Oh, you give me old finger sandwiches upstairs, downstairs, eh? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> you watch oh Pennyworth, the origin of Batman's Butler. That's most of the dialogue. I of course, I'm just quoting it. I'm just quoting. Yeah, it. That's exactly. the uh, big reveal at the end. There's a cliffhanger at the end of episode five. Yeah. Anyway, good book. Let's move on. Talk about Namor: Conquered Shores, number two from Marvel. Uh, this yeah. before you move on, Alex. Yes. Before you move on, this is yeah. a good book. I will say we're really wallowing in the fact that Alfred killed Batman and a couple Robin. Yeah, this book is and I again, we've said that's very cool. I'm surprised we saw it again here. um, Because it's like, yes, we do know that. I do like where this book is going. Um, Superman given a real knuckle sandwich to one of those little floating trolls (laughs) was very fun. Um, And looking forward to more um, surprising fights in this um, potentially out of continuity battle. But who knows once Mr. Mitzelplick is in the Mitzelplick. Namor, Conquered Shores, number two from Marvel, written by Christopher Cantwell, art by Pasquale Ferry. This takes place in a post-apocalyptic world where pretty much most of the world has been destroyed except for the sea. So Namor should be in charge, but he is abdicated to Namor Rita, I believe. Not Namora, but Namor Rita. Namor Rita. Namor Rita. She's like a margarita, but Namor. Exactly. She's got a salt rim. And uh, she is teaming (laughs) up with Luke Cage. To try to figure out what's going on with Jim Hammond, the original Human Torch, who has shown up, we get some um, answers about that or potential answers about that in this issue. I'm enjoying this as a the end style story. What do you guys? Oh, think? yeah, good call. Yeah, I mean we're getting old versions of characters. So we old Namer, old Luke Cage here. Um, but uh, super type bananas art. I mean, this is just uh, some really great Really art. pushing me here. Really yeah, pushing yeah. me to well, the edge. Uh, didn't say anything new. Uh, but yeah, just really um, kind of fun. Yeah, it does remind me of This is the End, uh, that series. Um, but in a good way. I mean, the, the scandalous kind of Sue Storm, uh, Namor uh, oh, we have here. A little it. too much for me. Uh, you know what I mean? Like. What? Uh, You're the yeah. guy who's like hates on Sue Storm being with Reed Richards. You well, you don't like what she's No, with I want I want her to leave Reed Richards because he treats her like shit and uh get with someone who appreciates her. Do I'm you think Namor's sure. the guy who's I like really gonna take care of her? Because he's nah, sort of known as a straight up That's dick. why I'm worried. That's why I say I don't like any of this. Um 
I love this series. I think this is a great, uh, great. The, there was a moment in this when you see um, Namor, Captain America, who's also old, and they're looking at the Human Torch, and they're like, "Hey, remember we're all old friends from World War II? And like, I was like, "All oh, right, of course they have this sort of original connection, which I thought was really cool. Um, I like the post-apocalyptic angle we're getting. I think a Pasquale Ferry art, which I've always loved. Um, Pascal Flaherty did an uh, Adam Strange series ages ago that I just fell in love with the way that um, uh-huh. he draws sort of the futuristic things. And it's even though it's like a burned out version of the future, I still think it's great. Resident Alien, the Book of Love, number one from Dark Horse Comics, written by Peter Hogan, art by Steve Parkhouse. This is a continuation of the Resident Alien series. Not the TV series, but the comic book series about a alien living in a small town working as a doctor. Here, as you can probably tell from the title, he is dating a human woman and they're trying to figure out how their parts work together while a bunch of oh, other stuff is going on in the background. Aren't we all? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, that's literally the plot of the book, Pete. So there you go. Yeah, I know, but you kind of spoiled that, that one part where they were. Uh, like, sorry, I, he's I just trying to figure out where all the figure sandwiches go. Yeah. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. This this is a, a great comic. Really fun. Um, just uh, well drawn, and uh, it's a it's a great relationship comic. You know, I know uh, J T. Sizzle loves a good relationship comic. This is one. You know, people. You got a small towns. They talk. You know what I mean. And it's it's nice when people are pulling for you. You know, uh, when people are excited about a, a new young romance. So. Uh, yeah, I thought this was a great issue, fun kind of slice of life action going on here, and uh, I'm all for it. You know, this reminded me of um, uh, this, and this goes to you, uh, Peter, uh, the page, um, the uh, concrete, the, a book that we yeah. had and loved. But this has um, some elements of that, less emo, a little more yep. comedy leaning than yep. um, concrete. But it is like um, people and uh, with sci-fi circumstances that are on sort of under persecution just trying to uh hang out and fall in love and isn't that what we're all doing fair enough murder world are we all aren't we all resident aliens oh my god oh i didn't even think about that we're the resident aliens bro i'm going on a a voyages of my own murder world avengers number one from marvel written by Jim Zub and ray fox art by jethro morales this is squid game in the marvel universe i mean that's say oh, no more right come say on, nothing man. come more. on no, legitimately that's like, on, here here's what i'll say about this love jib Zub, love ray fox i was bummed out when the concept was like straight up squid game in the marvel universe but they kind of make it work anyway and i think the reason they make it work is because arcade is a fun character murder world is fun yeah. the twist they find mm-hmm. by the end there is fun and as usual it's well executed with the characters they're good writers the art is solid so even though it's like 100 percent clearly whoever edited this book was like what if we did squid game in the marvel universe with murder world it still works because it's a solid idea. I agree with everything you're saying because I was like bummed out. And I, I, well, I, I had the same experience. I was like, oh, this is interesting. Oh, it's Squid Game. Oh, there's no other twist to it. It's just Squid Game. But it is a well-written and well-drawn comic. So the, um, the thing for, I, I wish there was just one more, either an acknowledgement of how close to Squid Game they were um to make to at least show ownership of the idea or just an additional twist that gave it um something a little bit of extension away from squid game because it is a little too close but still a well-executed comic i mean you know whatever popular fucking thing that's going on right now is uh it's cool but it's not you know it's its own separate sorry dad dad i need if you're going to be here you have to uh, put pants on you can't do the podcast in your tidy way no, dude dad. if alan moore can't can just do it, sit I'm here and shout at us no you can't just shout at us about your, your pop culture squid game stuff without yeah you um, crazy kids and your goddamn squid games 
Um, yeah, I just think that this is a fun use of arcade and then just a fun use of the Avengers as villains here. I mean, the spoilers, but Cap uh, uh, decapitating a guy uh, with his Cap shield was such a... Decapitating. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's why... He's decapped in America, Tate. That's why I put the emphasis on the right So here, I'm going to throw something out at you. And again, I want to mention that generally speaking, I had a good time with this comic book and I really enjoyed where it ended up in a very dark way. But it reminded me of this book that Dennis Hopeless wrote called Avengers Arena, which the concept of that yes. was essentially, what if Murder World but the Hunger Games? And so they took a bunch of teen... Yeah heroes some of them who you kind of knew some that were created for the book threw them you, on an island together can i, can I in, get back to my point or? hold on i love that in book. different sections and that made them fight it started with that but it expanded greatly from there very quickly in a very different direction that's what i want from this book to find it expand in a different direction to match that potentially um pete take it away Great. So thanks for interrupting. I, I feel like, uh, you know, the decapitation was such a crazy, fun, oh shit moment. And then the kind of classic, we know arcade and we know you shouldn't make deals with him or, or, or try to play with him. So like the character that we finally just started to like at the end there, it was such a crazy kind of last panel. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, regardless of whatever pop thing you want to throw on it i think that it was just a uh it's a it's a fun premise and a, a great uh they delivered so who cares what you fucking call it they they deliver on a, on a comic level and it's very have enjoyable. you seen squid game i'm gonna uh, guess no no, no. Uh, yes. too scary right okay yes this is straight uh, up the plot you... of squid game down to some plot beats so that that's the issue do you feel like about. who who fucking cares uh, well, I guess Alex. Why don't we and I just talk for, about the comic? Yeah, we are two Let thirds of the people of other podcast. Yeah. Your yeah. two best friends. We should have a squid game. We should play. A, yeah, we're two best friends. Huh? Yeah, the the best. We should play a squid game. <laughs> the best friends you ever had. <laughs> um, <laughs> do, you think best friends. do you think arcade? Uh, yeah. Do you think arcade is like? Uh, I wish I do. I need to change my name. Like it's a little old. It's a little mm -hmm. like. Oh yeah, we're, not, we're sort of not like doing PS5 arcade and... or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like <laughs> cloud-based gaming. System. I'm not arcade anymore. I'm Steam. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> ten thousand black feathers, number three from Image Comics, written by Jeff Lemire, art by Andrea Sorrentino. This is the beginning of the Bone Orchard mythos, and here we're getting the story of two women, one of whom disappeared one of whom who is trying to find them years later. Uh, and there's a lot of feathers falling. I love this book. I don't know what's going on. Well, like a lot of the Jeff Lemire, the Lemire Sorrentino universe, it's like we get snippets. The books seem a little bit like they don't give us a lot of uh, plot per se. They give us a lot of imagery and it's all very cool. Everything that's happening is cool. It's like the one with the pets in the space where it's mm -hmm. like that's very cool but i'm always just like ah you're leaving me just it's like just a little like they put the your lunch on your in your mouth but then they take it right back out <laughs> wow you ever intense. been to a restaurant like oh, that? that classic thing you're yeah. what you're just <laughs> complaining because you don't have enough you know what i mean it's like an appetizer exactly. and you want the whole i got a taste but i want to yeah, chew yeah. i got a taste yeah. but i want to yeah. chew yeah. by the way uh, like... have you guys been to tyler florence's mouth dippers that restaurant that he opened where <laughs> Like takes food. Mouth dippers. Welcome to mouth dippers. We're just gonna dip it in and then take it away. Uh, yeah. yeah. The, here's how they save money. They use the same piece of the lunch to <laughs> oh, the whole okay. table. Oh, that's so gross. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I I feel like they're doing a great job of kind of giving us little uh, bits of a story in such a creative, artistic Sorry, mouth way. Mouth dips. Mouth dips of a story. I'm not going to say that. Um, and I, I appreciate the artistic choices that they're taking with the, uh, you know, the beauty and the beast pedal that's slowly falling and you hope mm -hmm. it doesn't hit the ground. Um, but I just think that, um, uh, yeah, we're getting a, a little bit at a time here and I felt like I'm happy with my mouth uh, bit that I got uh, 
So I, I have no complaints, and uh, I'm enjoying this story and how it's unfolding and at and its pace. But yeah, the the creepy shadowing uh, and the the art style in this is also uh, uh, such a cool part of this uh, package deal. So it's a it's a tight package, and uh, I'm enjoying all the little tidbits that we're getting. Here, here's what I just want to throw out there. If Image Comics listens to this review and they put on the trade collection for 10,000 Black Feathers, Mouth Dippers, Comic Book Club, I'll stop doing this podcast. Uh, <laughs> that's what you want? Yeah. That's, that's, that's not a good saying. pull that's quote. Pinnacle. They're not going to do that because it's not a good pull quote. Mouth it's got to be something that makes sense and makes somebody uh, want to read it. If you picked it up and saw someone go mouth dippers, you're not going to be like, oh, well, I got to get be, this. I don't know. I'd be interested to find out more. I would want to find out more. Oh, my God. <laughs> you don't and, read and, the comic and then think to yourself, oh, mouth dippers. I know what they're talking about. It makes sense. Pila Page, master of the pull quote. That's why he's coming at us. <laughs> <laughs> What's well, my quote? Type so bananas it's not make, make getting it. riper. Yeah. Travuch Kirkvolt, number four from ID Development <laughs> Publishing, written by Scott Bright Wilson, art by Leanna Cogus. This is actually True Cult, number four. We had them on the show. There we go. Thank you. With them. This is about a bunch of burger flippers who have gotten sucked into a cult that wants to bring about the apocalypse or the end of the world or something like that. It's purposefully not 100% clear. But spoilers here, as it turns out, this issue it actually is a true cult and they do actually yeah. not just worship the devil, but the devil is there and shows up by the end. I love the tone of this book and how well it yes. matches the execution through the art. Uh, I'm really enjoying this so far. Justin seems like you're enjoying it as well. Uh, yes. And I think I love the tone as well. And I love just the going hard and commitment to the premise. Um, when we had them on the show, we talked about the book and they were very coy about it. They never sort of tipped their hand that we were going to get into very real, like satanic things. And they go there and the characters like maintain. I, I love that. And this book is like, it, it's such a nice, it's four issues in and they're pushing the story hard. It's, excuse me, it's a nice four issue read if you haven't picked it up. Yeah, I very much appreciate the creativity that they're uh, that they're doing and how they're kind of telling this story. It's it's a crazy reveal, and uh, you know, it's like if you would have kind of just like loaded this all in the front, like, oh yeah, it's a satanic cult. I don't know how I'll be into it, but I'm liking the way that they're kind of dropping the information on us. Also, I appreciate the fact that this devil is you know, he's covering up his junk with skulls. You know what I mean? Like, I appreciate that extra step. You know, it's like, hey, devil, you're yeah. going to the surface world. Maybe put on your, uh, you know, skull junk cover. You know what I mean? So it's nice to see him kind of take that extra step for us. You guys ever signed any um, skull junk covers? When fans come up to you? <laughs> All the time. All no, the time. Human skull? Yep. Iron Man not, 650 for Marvel, written by Christopher Cantwell. Once again, Maria uh, Iodele, Kurt Busaic, art by Angel Unzanetta, Doton Akande, and Benjamin Dewey. This is three tales of Iron Man, one of them a back in the day tale from Kurt Busaic, the other one, the other two new ones, but they're sort of done in one stories that get to the core of Tony Stark. What do you guys think about this? Uh, yeah, I feel like this was a, a kind of a classic Iron Man uh, a story. You got a Tony kind of like beating up on himself a little bit, but uh, I really like the old timey kind of uh, comic that we got in this, the middle story. Um, just love the art style. Had such a great feel. Uh, brought me back uh, to a kid reading comics, so really appreciate that. The, the one with radioactive man of madam mask i love a villain who like announces his name mm -hmm. you know that's always yeah. a fun classic kind the, of uh, yeah the comic flashback trip. story yeah. the throwback story that is um yeah this was it's interesting the the sort of the front story that felt the the sort of incontinuity story um i hadn't realized that iron man and patsy walker are mm -hmm. a thing yeah they uh, um, almost got married or did I, 
I think they sort of are engaged, it seems like, but mm -hmm. also they're not talking on the reg. So it feels mm -hmm. a little strange. Um, but I like I like that relationship. That's interesting. Um, the You're second shipping story, it? I, I'm shipping it. The second Ooh. story I thought was fun. I really like the art of that one. And like Pete's saying, the third one, third story feels like some good um, classic, uh, re reinventing the classic. Junkyard Joe, number two from Image Comics, written by Jeff Johns, art by Gary Frank. This is part of their new universe of stories here. We're focusing on a robot soldier who fought in Vietnam. And I think we talked about the first issue as like, wow, that was a really interesting one shot. Clearly not a one shot. In fact, we catch yeah. up years later Two with shot. the soldier who fought with Junkyard Joe, the robot, and he has created a very, oh my gosh, what is it? Uh, what, what's the cartoon about soldiers? Oh, uh, Beetle Bailey. Bailey? Beetle Bailey, that's what I'm Beetle thinking Bailey. of. Yeah, it's very Beetle, Beetle Bailey, Bailey style newspaper and, cartoon say, about Andy Junkyard Cap. Joe that's and it. his experiences. Um, and it, it catches up with him as well as some new characters. I thought this was really good. I mean, Gary Frank's art is good. There's a lot of good emotion here, so, and the story is very interesting. What do you guys think, Justin? Again, it seems like you like this one. I feel a, I feel the same way. Like this is one of my favorite. Jeff Johns feels like he's doing a lot more in the comic world in the last six months, and this is one of my favorite things that he's done. It feels like good concept, good mystery, like a little bit of dread and we get some sort of world opening up stuff that happens here at the end. Um, and the Gary Frank art, uh, just killer. Gary Frank, all the way back to, I guess I first encountered his work on Hulk, Incredible Hulk, uh, back in the days of the Pantheon and all of that. Ooh. Love the work. Um, and it, it's really great here. Yeah, I agree. The, the Frank kills it on this. But I, I also think that it was such a cool use of a robot where you're kind of like, he appears and the guy's like is this real is this kind of like and you know it's a robot face so it's not giving him anything to kind of go on and just really adds to the dread of like is this guy good is he bad like is he the friend he remembers like so very cool setup really love the kind of twists we get at the end here yeah this is just a, an all-star cast kind of working on a great project and it seems like people are having fun and uh it's a very cool story something is killing the children number 26 from boom studios written by james tyne the fourth art by werther didaria in this JT4. issue in jg yes jt4 in this issue our main character has been knocked down by a monster but there is a monster of another sort who is coming directly for her i believe it's cutter who is another member of the house of slaughter or outside the house of slaughter who's coming to kill her so there's a lot of forces coalescing on the small town at the same time this is the kickoff of a new arc for this book and i think this is an exciting place for it to be frankly I've enjoyed this for 26, 25 issues so far, and I enjoyed the 26th. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. This is just oh, a nice. very, it's a very consistent book, you know, like every issue. I'm like, yeah. yes, this is very good. This is very well drawn. It's very tense. It's good. Yeah, they do a great job with the tension in this comic. Uh, just the the still panels, uh, uh, using them in such a cool way that kind of builds the tension of like what's going on, what's going to happen. Yeah, this uh, for me just continues to be this uh, a great comic and exploring this world. <coughs> Excuse me, we've had like some kind of one-off issues where we dealt with different houses and kind of how that all got together, but like this here we're kind of focused on this main uh, killing character and what she's kind of going through and her little monster that she talks to i i, I love the art so much it's such a great world yeah. that it brings you into and um yeah i i just can't get enough of it i i love every single one of these issues it continues to be such a banger uh, i mean this this issue slaps you know what i mean <laughs> Nice. Dropping that TikTok language like we like to hear. Um, JT4 has sort of um, taken over comics in a way, um, especially an announcement today about having JT4 having a whole line over at uh, Dark Horse. Um, 
this book was like one of the early JT4 just bangers, um, as Pete was saying, that slaps so hard. And um, I think it it still does. It, it's one of the books I was talking about it in earlier reviews we've done for I'm saying that it was like not quite moving at the pace I expected. And it's just this pace is consistent, though. This is the, the type of story he wants to tell. It's moving at the pace of like, sort of slow, slow, fast, slow, slow, fast. And like, um, if like you an can Andor. get with that, hmm. um, it's sort of like an Andor. Where it's like yeah. slow, slow, and then you're like, holy shit. Yeah, fair enough. This is definitely a mouth dipper that slaps, and we can all agree <laughs> on that. But last but not least, <laughs> She-Hulk number eight from Marvel, written by Rainbow Rowell, art by Takeshi Miyazawa. Uh, Zawa, excuse me, in this issue, we are focusing on the villains of this arc, two scientists who want to give themselves gamma powers, they have focused on She-Hulk, we had a bit of a reveal of them last issue, and now we zoom back in time to show how they got there. This is a great issue of a book that I yeah. think last issue I called out and this took me too long to realize, but that, oh, this is a romance book. What Romero Rowell is writing here is a romance book. And that's exactly what she writes here as well. We get this great romance between these two villain characters that goes horribly wrong and means bad things for She-Hulk, but such a good character dive going on and so well-crafted. What a tra... This is such a tragic standalone story. Like, if you weren't reading any of the other She-Hulk books or anything, like... This still stands alone as just like a tale of a real romance obsession, people who are compromising themselves for their um, own sort of selfish benefit. And uh, it, it's a, I'm very look, much looking forward to where this goes next when it, we get back to She-Hulk and, and Jack of Hearts and what's happening there. But I feel sympathy for these villains at the same time, I will not like what they're about to do next. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about uh, sympathy. You know, uh, you you have these people who are smart, and this is why I don't trust smart people because they're up to nefarious things with their intelligence. Really? And uh, you know, and it's also this thing of like, you know, they want power, you know, but they're, you know, what are you doing with it? What is it for? And it's not for good reasons, and things go horribly wrong. So it's kind of like it's hard to feel for them, but. Uh, an amazing story of love and, ro and romance and uh, kind of things gone too bad. Uh, but yes, it's, it's definitely a very cool, interesting take. You know, I wish I knew all the cool TV shows I could compare it to something, you know, it's like a so-and-so House of Dragons <laughs> meets whatever the fuck is popular. So I just, <laughs> you know, but uh, very creative and cool and unique. You know? Yeah. To always leave one in the chamber, Pete. <laughs> And if you'd like to support this podcast and all the podcasts, we do patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Crowdcast on YouTube. Come hang out. We would love to chat with you about comic books, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show at Comic Book Live on Twitter. As long as that lasts, I guess, at Comic Book Club Live <laughs> on Instagram and TikTok. Comicbookclublive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, we'll see you at the comic book shop. Mouth dippers, let us put <laughs> something in your mouth briefly. <laughs> <laughs>